This is Going Underground, I'm Afshin Ritatsi. Coming up in the show, former MI5 agent Annie Mashaw reveals how British intelligence created the militant groups we're now out to destroy. And manipulating images to manipulate the public's appetite for war. Plus, David Cameron openly blames the Syrian president for the rise of militant extremism. But is Britain secretly holding talks with the Assad government? All this and more coming up on today's Going Underground. The British media loves the story of the current protests in Hong Kong. Collective amnesia about British colonialism in China means that there just isn't time to mention how British politicians, like the last governor, Chris Patton, never thought to institute anything approaching democracy in the colony. And the BBC, which used to be chaired by Patton, hasn't had the time to remind us about the British opium wars. We suppose the fact that David Cameron's great-grandfather ran HSBC, which was founded to drug and kill off the population of China with opium, just isn't news either. More seriously, it seems London's allies in Washington are hijacking any legitimate demands demonstrators in the former colony might have, whether it be Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Egypt or Ukraine. Washington is busy destabilizing nations through something called the National Endowment for Democracy. Here is Ned publicizing its $139,000 of U.S. taxpayer money being funneled to an outfit called the American Center for International Labor Solidarity in Hong Kong. And here's Ned spending nearly half a million dollars for something shady called the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs in Hong Kong. Maybe Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, ExxonMobil, McDonald's and the arms company Boeing, which are also behind the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy, would care to drop us a line. All three major parties support war in Iraq now. Even the Liberal Democrats meeting in Glasgow today want bombing. But what about Britain's role in sponsoring ISIS? With me is former MI5 agent Annie Mashaw. Annie, welcome back to Going Underground. So uh, is this a continuation of the 2003 war, first of all? I think it's certainly a, an expected outcome. Even senior spies uh, were advising Tony Blair back in 2003, particularly the head of MI, MI5, Damien Liza Manion Buller. She was saying, if we do this, we are going to be causing more problems in the future and creating new generations of terrorists. And even she has gone on the record since as well and said, we can't defeat terrorism by war. What we have to do is negotiate as we did with the provisional IRA. So yes, Britain has a diabolical responsibility for what is now happening to the terrorized peoples in Syria and in Iraq. But yet by going in, we're increasing the threat. Well, the threat to British national security particularly mm. as well, which of course was supposedly her mandate. So it was very cavalier for the then Prime Minister Tony Blair to just dismiss the um, you know, thought out advice of the top spy in the UK dedicated to protecting our national security in Britain. And she repeated that evidence of the Chilcot Inquiry, which she we did. still don't yeah. know about. But she, uh, in fairness, since everyone's saying how wonderful she is, she didn't really mention about <laughs> um, how the intelligence services may have been funding those very groups. So uh, we know obviously about how our we helped fund and uh, train the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Who are we training now that we're now trying to kill? Well, very good question. I mean, the intelligence agencies in the UK have a long and ignoble history of um, funding people they think will be helpful to fight other perceived threats in danger zones around the world. And then, of course, that goes wrong, and these groups now, we're very well funded, come back and bite them. We saw that in Libya in the 1990s. We've seen that in Iraq and in Syria as well over the last few years. So this is perfectly standard, but you think they would learn from their mistakes in the past. They would see that, well, it didn't happen so well there. Now we've got um, an Al-Qaeda you know, type affiliates running rampant across Libya. Why on earth, why on earth did they um, advise David Cameron to try and intercede in Syria last year to topple Assad and fund these very groups, which of course has now led to al-Nusra and other groups mutating into ISIS. And that's well, precisely you, what we're seeing. But you're suggesting incompetence, even seasoned observers of incompetence by the Foreign Office and its agencies. Yeah. Even they are saying, and they're not people who like conspiracy, are saying, how could any government be this uh, incompetent when it comes to, as we say now, tornadoes bombing people that British taxpayers themselves may have been funding uh, as recently as last year? Well, you say incompetent, I would say thick. <laughs> but, um, of course, these are predictable outcomes. 
Um, so they must have had that advice. They must have been aware of the, the risks they were taking. And there must be some other deeper understanding for a potential benefit, either to perhaps certain segments of industry, the arms industry, the oil industry, whatever. But you worked in the intelligence services. There's no way someone from BA Systems, I think, that make the GR4 Tornado would come into the office there, in MI6, for instance, I suppose it would be, saying, come on then, uh, last year, I was telling you to do this, now I'm telling you to buy more of this, to bomb that. Well, we know very well that big corporations do use strong lobbying against uh, the politicians, and the politicians very often go along with it. In fact, there was only a report to, uh, today or yesterday, I think, Sir Jeremy Haywood, the top civil servant in the country, who uh, is now known as uh, Sir Coverup, I think, because he's the one who refused to uh, disseminate the private communications between Blair and Bush in the Chilcot Inquiry, which is why it's been held up. So Sir Coverup has um, now been out here as having all these lovely dinners and all expensive paid trips to the opera and all the rest of it with precisely these sort of companies. So that is where the influence is, is done. It's not sitting down in an office and having a proper meeting. It's, you know, having a few drinks at the opera or going out for a fine wines and a big lunch or something. And it does go on. It's naive to think that it wouldn't. And it's naive to think that parties which are dependent on donations from these big corporations will turn deaf ears to the interests of those big corporations. But the intelligence agencies themselves more immune to it than the opera-going politicians? Well, they tend to be revolving doors, particularly uh, between MI6 and certain of these big companies when these people retire at 55. Um, and they're you know, often good chums and they know each other, same background and things like that. So there's very strong interconnection there. So even, for example, if MI5 were advising against this misadventure in Syria that has metastasized into ISIS, even if they were doing that, there is a good chance that their rivals and often um, mortal enemies, MI6, would be advising the very opposite and putting the sort of corporate screws on the government to go ahead and do this for their chums. Well, I'm not saying that's the case, but that's how it can work. And well, either way, MI5, if Dame Eliza was accurate then, probably no less accurate now, they'll be left to pick up the pieces. Do you think the fact that we have intelligence in the groups that we're trying to then afterwards attack gives us any advantage when it comes to the, uh, the uh, home attacks that we can now expect because of the war in Iraq? I would hope that um, by cultivating some of these contacts and perhaps being able to turn them, we can go back to uh, a greater reliance on human intelligence, on human, because that's where you get the precise information about planned terrorist plots and things like that. And it's also how you can gather evidence and then hopefully arrest people and put them on trial. In so, by so in a sense, by creating our own enemies, we're better at being able to tackle them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a slightly disingenuous yeah, so. <laughs> interpretation, but um, no, of course, they will, they will be doing this. And Britain historically was always much better at humans. Uh, it was always the Americans that over relied on technological superiority and you know, electronic surveillance and things. Unfortunately, what we have seen over the last decade since 9-11 and the war on terror began is the British being pulled more and more into the orbit of the American intelligence community, and they've lost that sort of human edge. And they've gone increasingly, as we've seen from the Edward Snowden disclosures, down the path of big dragnet surveillance. And they will say, yes, but we have to have this big surveillance because then we can find these individual terrorists. They have human sources that they can turn within these groups and get detailed, pinpointed information back on what they've been planned. Much more effective than dragnet surveillance and looking for that fabled needle in the haystack. So Jeremy Haywood, incidentally, of course, uh, related to the Snowden stuff because it was him <laughs> yeah. who walked into the Guardian and tried to smash up the computers. Well, perhaps we, we should call say, this a smash up then rather well, than well, a cover up. He's welcome to be on this program anytime. <laughs> well, uh, but then if uh, we were so good at human intelligence, even journalists were saying when Cameron wanted us to bomb Assad's troops for the rebels, even journalists were saying that these rebels were obviously allied to forces that back um, the Saudi Wahhabi cause. Mm -hmm. Why, why did MI6 not report back immediately to uh, the William Hague or Hammond and say, look, this is, this is a mess? Obviously, they're reading the wrong newspapers. No, it was generally accepted, of course. Um, you know, my enemy's enemy is always going to be my enemy. <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily going to be an effective friend. So there must be some deeper reason why the spies have not put the brakes on this uh, funding. Of this and you're group. suggesting it could be the lobbying, because as you said, if it's in the public domain, that Britain is supporting people that would do Britain harm. MI6 definitely knew that we were doing that. Well, I don't know for sure in this case, but I know for sure in um, older cases, particularly if we look what happened in Libya, where uh, Sir Mark Allen, who is the head of the counter-terrorism section in MI6, 
then went on to work for BP, uh, was one of the key go-betweens between Blair and Gaddafi for the, the deal in the desert and the handing over of uh, the torture victim, Abdel Hakim Balhaj, and all the rest of it. So they were willing to hand over people for torture. They were willing to make dodgy deals in the desert, all in order to get the oil deals for BP and other corporate interests. So we know that. It's all on the public record Although the then head of BP came on going underground recently and said, <laughs> actually, it's... Um, that was all coincidence. So um, how close do you think our ties are to Turkish intelligence then? Because Britain is now in effect supporting the PKK by the tornadoes bombing, which is a prescribed terror group here in Britain. But aside from that, do you think uh, the intelligence sharing with the French, with the Americans, how, how do you think that's going? Because we are at war now. Well, we're not officially at war, are we? Well, I don't, they voted <laughs> for war in Parliament. Um, but it's not against With the Islamic nation. State, yeah. which they seem to recognise. I don't know. Yeah. But what, what well, do you think? Well, that very recognition, they're legitimising it, which is crazy. So it's all this sort of circular thinking that makes a mess of the situation time and time and time again. Um, they will have to be working more closely with uh, Turkey and its intelligence agencies. Um, I'm not sure historically if they did greatly. Um, but one of the problems we're seeing post-Snowden, of course, is this sort of breakdown of trust about how much information you do share between different countries' intelligence agencies. Um, and I think probably Britain will still be working very closely with America, but not perhaps so much with some of its other NATO allies. They will be worried about leakage. And let alone Turkey, isn't it about time Saudi Arabia shared a bit more intelligence? What, did, what was uh, Saudi cooperation like when you were in MI5, and how do you think it's changed now? Do you think they're telling us more about the groups that uh, they've hitherto been funding or suddenly discovered they are the enemy like we have? <laughs> Uh, well, I think it's certainly been reported that a number of, of big donors to ISIS are, kind of, are still in Saudi Arabia. So on the one hand, they're, they're supporting this group, and then on the other hand, they're saying, yes, of course, we'll help our Western allies and our, our favorite buddies in America to try and suppress this group. They're having it both ways. So I wouldn't have thought that that much more information is emerging out of their intelligence agencies. Um, it will be very carefully selected to ensure that they can continue playing both sides of the game. Because arguably what we now know let alone about 9-11 stuff. Um, if we had had intelligence agents uh, within the Saudi firmament, we'd know a lot more about these militant groups uh, that are rampaging across the Middle East. We would think, we would expect to, yes. Um, I'm sure they will have agents, but we're just not getting the information. Annie Mashaw, thank you. Coming up after the break, do you believe everything you see with your own eyes? And if you do, you better not read a Murdoch newspaper, especially if it concerns freed Guantanamo detainee Moazam Beg. All this and more in part two of Going Underground. Traditionally, wars were fought with troops, planes, tanks, missiles, and a whole lot of money. Today, warfare is very different. Now it's about financial flows, sanctions, and proxy wars. Is Washington making one hard push to eliminate its adversaries? Now this is the water that they cannot drink anymore. Nobody will drink something like this. And it kills people quick. Snaps my teeth off. They found all this lovely stuff in my water. Oh, uh, uranium-235 and 236. Those are gas wells and, and they're on, on our pad, our property. But there should be more wells here. And um, like everybody, I like money. Article 1, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. It has our right to clean air and clean water and, and enjoyment of your land. And we don't have it. In the past few days, a British citizen, previously kidnapped and illegally sent to a torture camp by the Americans, was released from a British prison before all charges against him were dropped. This is how the Murdoch Times commented on his arrest. How Amnesty chose the wrong poster boy. Yes, to the Murdoch press, even Amnesty International's exoneration of the man was a mistake. And then the Sunday Times said this. Free terrorism suspect Moazm Beg back in court. For the Sunday Times, people illegally incarcerated in Guantanamo are always terror suspects. That's even after every US agency, from the CIA to the Department of Homeland Security, couldn't find anything on him after three years in detention. 
But then the British press always plays fast and loose to serve powerful interests. Take a look at this from The Guardian. Ukraine, how to close the door on Putin. Europe can resolve this crisis and counter Russia's aggression, but it needs a clear 10-year plan. The Guardian dispenses with reporting the NATO-backed killing in Donetsk in Ukraine. Instead, it gives a platform to a bizarre neocon, Timothy Garton Ash, who wants a 10-year military war with Russia. Meanwhile, what about that other war we're fighting? RAF, it's personal. We'll hit Islamic State for David Haynes. Yep, the RAF tells Richard Desmond Starr that the UK taxpayer is paying £33,000 an hour for flying tornadoes on some kind of personal vendetta against criminals. This obviously has nothing to do with geopolitical strategy. As for Evgeny Lebedev's independent, there's one crucial question about our action in Iraq. Is it safe to holiday in Turkey? Good point. Forget the mounting death toll of women and children, let alone the risk to our servicemen and women. Can we go on holiday in the NATO ally that has been allowing ISIS to flourish? Actually, Foreign Office advice is that there is a high threat from terrorism in Turkey, more than in, say, Israel. And one media darling who opened his wallet for Israel's army is, of course, X Factor's Simon Cowell. You'll remember he donated £100,000 to the Israeli war effort just a few months before the latest carnage in Gaza. You know my views on animal cruelty. Simon Cowell cuts controversial X Factor scenes. Animal cruelty? Richard Desmond's Express should surely be more bothered about the cruelty of X Factor presenters against Palestinian children, not animals. One minute the public are tired of British wars, the next they're all for it. And many put that down to ISIS imagery. Stills and moving footage all uploaded to the internet. So how can public sentiment be so swayed so easily by pictures? Joining me in the studio is Professor Julian Stalambras of the Courtauld Institute of Art. Welcome to Going Underground, Julian. I know we've manipulated this behind here. Um, how easily swayed is the public by imagery? Well, images are incredibly powerful uh, and they become more so, arguably, as technology has developed. Uh, they're all around us, they flow very fast, there are massive numbers of them. Uh, they're easily manipulated by all sorts of different and diverse agents. So we're kind of moving away from a situation where the mass media had, you know, a kind of lockdown on the sorts of news images we see. Uh, into a much more diverse uh, extremist, arguably, and uh, you know, politically interesting territory. In which... Or does it lessen the importance of the images because they're so prevalent more generally? Aren't they always saying that people are more and more sophisticated now after generations of advertising, but the internet has helped people see through uh, lies in imagery? I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, you know, if you go back far enough to the great days of photojournalism, those images were largely accepted by the public as truth-telling images. Although, in fact, uh, those photojournalists and the editors who produced those images often manipulated them far more than would be allowed now, uh, precisely because they were analog images, they were thought to tell the truth. And so, you know, they, they did things like picture collages uh, of the news, which would, you know, be a sacking offence now, and in fact has been a sacking offence. Arguably more than now, because there was the... Unless people are just making mistakes in mm. mainstream media. Yeah. Celebrated, uh, celebrated case of John Kerry trying to persuade the American public to war in Syria using pictures from the Iraq 2003 war to mm. talk about... Assad atrocities. Yes. Well, this is something that's been going on on all sides as well. And the, the recent ISIS uh, video, for instance, contains material from all sorts of sources. And it's very unclear often, you know, what those things are and how they're thrown together for a particular propaganda effect. But it's interesting to see the state doing the same thing and, and getting it wrong sometimes. We're fed. The uh, Pentagon beautifully produced yes. imagery and pictures look like Hollywood movies. So there's a... Uh, there's a kind of persuasion there for news broadcasters to say, we'll show this as how the war is going. Well, that's one of the more disturbing elements, I think, in all this, is the way in which the news media has become hollowed out, really, by the adoption of you know, more and more business values. So the whole news cycle has sped up, 
course, enormously, especially with 24-hour news and blogging and you know, all, the, all of that digital media. There are less and less resources to conduct serious investigative journalism. So a lot of the stuff which is, comes down from the state and the military sort of PR arms you know, just goes straight into the news. Is it enough so to just not... to say courtesy mm. Pentagon? Or do you think the imagery itself is so powerful that it, it makes, certainly here at home in Britain, where we look at the tornado aircraft videos and go, our boys are doing something good? Well, the, um, there's more skepticism, and rightly so, especially because there's, you know, there are fewer checks you know, in the mainstream media. Um, but at the same time, it's hard to know very often, you know, how to interrogate those images intelligently. Where does the information come from? Where does the counter information uh, to, to allow us to understand, you know, how we are being manipulated? So there's power there in that flow of images across the news, um, despite people's skepticism. It's a bit like the way that advertising works. I mean, you know, everyone looks at this picture of a beautiful model. They know perfectly well that the thing has been photoshopped to death and that the, the creature that they see before them has no it reality. It MP Brooks Newmark didn't. It yeah, well, said, but, yes, yeah. yeah, well, actually, that was, uh, that was a, a relatively unmanipulated image grabbed from someone's social media page. That case is ongoing. Yeah, yeah, but sorry, yeah. I interrupted okay. you. Go on, yeah. Um, so, as with advertising images, we know they're false, but they have an effect nevertheless. And I think that news images are often like that too. So uh, we knew about embedding during the 2003 war. So we're all in effect becoming embedded because the broadcasters are using these images that come straight from the Ministry of Defense and the State Department? Yes, often without much acknowledgement as well. So uh, the, uh, the, military, the Ministry of Defense, for instance, uh, has you know, many videographers and photographers embedded with their troops who are soldiers, right? And they're producing very standard propaganda images, which actually the genres of which have not very much changed since the Second World War, you know soldiers being nice to kids, uh, military sunsets, these kinds of things. Um, and those go into the newspapers often without acknowledgement of the source. So if you just see um, a regular, uh, an image with a news agency credit, but no photographer, it's probably come from the military. Well, given that we don't have the other side, the pictures of the casualties, I mean, there were some video pictures of the immediate casualties caused by President Obama's airstrikes. What, what are broadcasters supposed to do? Not show the ones from the Ministry of Defense? I think that they should do both. Uh, and what I suppose one of the in very interesting things has been, uh, and you see this very clearly in the attacks on Gaza, is that it's more and more difficult to find populations which don't have access to cameras, to video, to social media, and who can talk back to us directly. And this is a hugely positive development in a sense. But far more were killed in Gaza than in, say, the latest advance of ISIS. And yet we had all that imagery of the killing of so many uh, men, women, and children. It didn't seem to have any impact on uh, public opinion, or did it? Or is that why the Israelis stopped bombing? I think that the Israeli state has yet to uh, fully catch up with this development. I think that uh, internationally, at least, um, that flow of footage out of Gaza did them a great deal of damage, as did you know, these images of Israelis sitting in deck chairs, you know, watching the bombardment going on as if it was some kind of sport. Um, I think that there's an evolving global humanism, in a sense, which comes out of the, this flow of images. Uh, and it's true in Iraq as well, at least, whereas the, the embedded footage uh, and the photographs were very controlled, very rarely showed blood or casualties or anything of that kind, and you know, concentrated on military competence and heroism and so on. The Arab media offered you know, very systematically completely the opposite view, and they talked to civilians extensively. Um, they, they showed their plights, and they showed what had happened to them. And sure enough, governments tried to ban them of course, after yeah. that. What do you think about those uh, experiments of subverting uh, what you're allowed to tell. The South African photographers, Broomberg and uh, Shannara, is that right? Uh, trying to subvert it by having pieces of photographic paper. Do you think it worked? What they did in that case um, was a, a very interesting mutation of the, uh, the embedding thing. So they were offered an embed with the British military in Afghanistan. Um, and indeed, they were obliged to take uh, propagandistic photographs while they were out there. So they would take these on their digital cameras and then delete them every night so that the military couldn't use them. Um, but they also took with them this massive roll of photographic paper. 
uh, and exposed it at certain points uh, when newsworthy things happened. And what they got was this uh, uh, series of prints which are rather abstract, but nevertheless they look rather somewhat dusky, like a dusk sky, but also Very with, abstract, with kind of... Think. Yes, yes, because all of you, you know, it's simply the imprint of light without a camera on the paper. Um, but also rather sort of bloody elements as well, you know, rust reds and so on. Um, and they titled them using these, um, you know, the, the, the news events. So they were ways of saying, well, there's all this stuff that we can't show you in a sense. And here is a sort of sublime abstract photographic work in which you can imagine it. If uh, only broadcast media yeah. were using yeah. that. So in the but to use them, I suppose to use the British military to create this work was part of the point of it. It was as much a performance as, uh, in a way, uh, and there's a video of them doing it and getting these soldiers to carry this huge piece of photographic paper around with them um, in it's a combat situation. the war effort. Well, exactly. Think, especially <laughs> if you look at what's happened to Afghanistan now. So in the current conflict, how uh, confident are you that we will be getting a uh, accurate picture based on watching our television broadcasts and reading the newspapers about the yet another war Britain's involved in in Iraq? Uh, well, I mean, journalism has always been the first draft of history, I suppose you would say, and accuracy always comes much later. We certainly saw that, you know, with the, with the older media, the much, you know, even the critical media of, of Vietnam took a long time, in fact, to unearth, you know, the full story of what was happening there. And, and arguably that's, that you know, process of historical digging uh, still goes on. Uh, but uh, I do think that by looking at diverse media, uh, looking at things that are not shown on the BBC, for instance, you know, you can do quite a lot yourself, uh, at least to expose yourself to different sorts of propaganda and then to think critically about the way those relate. Professor Julian Stalabras, thank you. Thanks. Remember David Cameron's speech at the United Nations in New York the other week, the one where he blamed the brutality of the secular Assad regime as one of the most powerful tools for recruiting ISIS extremists. Well, our Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond felt the same back in August when he ruled out an alliance with Assad, saying it would poison what we're trying to achieve. Mind you, we're not sure whether Hammond even knew who he was talking about at the time. Take a look at what happened when he gave us his words of wisdom about Syria a year earlier when he was Defence Secretary. The fact that the British Parliament has clearly voted that Britain should not take part in any action uh, against uh, Saddam Hussein as a consequence of the use of chemical weapons. Did President Assad use chemical weapons? Maybe not, according to investigative reporter Seymour Hirsch. And according to former United Nations investigator Carla Del Ponte, in fact, the evidence showed that it was the Syrian rebels who had, in fact, used chemical weapons. And is anyone going to point out to our foreign secretary that Saddam never even used to run Syria? Maybe MI6 could tell Hammond, especially since it is now alleged that our agents have been holding secret talks with the Assad government all along. The Foreign Office told Going Underground they could neither deny nor confirm reports of the secret communication between our spies and Assad's senior diplomats. But let's hope our intelligence agency can at least tell the difference between a dead Middle Eastern leader and a live one. That's it for today. Tune in on Wednesday when Guardian star columnist Holly Toynbee tells us that on the strength of last week's Tory conference, fascism could be around the corner. Before that, you can drop us a line on Twitter at underground underscore RT, like our page on Facebook, or email us on goingunderground at rttv.co.uk. See you on Wednesday.